I'm gonna get right to it. Uh, this is not gonna be simple. This might be the most intricately delivered word I've ever been given the opportunity to try to deliver. Um, I am so overwhelmed with the enormity of what I feel the Lord on this word that I am just praying that he takes what he has shown me and delivers it in a way that as you rewatch this will unpack in you what he just did in me for this time in history. Um, whether or not you've watched anything I've ever said, I'm going to try not to repeat a billion things except the things that are key to this. Uh, <laughs> for those of you that know me, pray for me on that. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm 44 this year. It's important because what I realized over the last three years, but growing, it, it took eight years for me to get to this point to realize that my life, um, part of what the Lord does through my life is he's made it a prophetic time clock uh, where I can look at the age that I am and the Psalms of that corresponding age and see what he wants to show me about the world at that time. Okay. That's important because I also have come to realize in the last few years, um, how much timing he actually wants to deliver to this world. And it's all embedded in here. And, uh, I had to own this fact of that God could use a life like this. I had to look at the word as more than just the word and realize they're not just stories, but they're actually people who God anointed for certain times in history and that he can still anoint people to do that. And it completely, completely could never have made this up. Uh, but knowing that when I finally was like, all right, Lord, this actually is what you're doing. Everything that he gave me suddenly had weight on it. Um, I didn't throw it out anymore. I didn't discount, didn't discount his word by discounting who I was, which I don't know who needs to hear that, but somebody needs to hear that. Don't discount what he's told you because of what you think about yourself. This is the Lord God of all creation, the one who came down, put on flesh and died for you, who is speaking to you. And if he gave you something, then it is your job to trust him. And that's what I'm going to do right now. Um, so this part, the word that I'm going to deliver started in July of 2020. Um, as I said, I was just kind of really trying to own this. Okay, you could be doing this, Lord. And I was in Psalm 90. Now we're in the middle of Corona, right? All the stuff going on. I'm in Psalm 90. And it says in verse four, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, like a watch in the night. And what the Lord quickened to me in that moment was, I remembered Jesus came to them in the fourth watch of the night. That's the story in Matthew 14, when he walks in the water, he sends them across and then he walks to them, right? He came in the fourth watch of the night and what he, I'm just going to say all this stuff, how it comes to me. It, it's a lifetime of learning how to hear him and grow that we can talk another time, but this is just the long and short of it. So he brought that scripture to memory. Instantly, I knew what he was trying to say because he's built this history with me. Fourth, he came in the fourth watch. I just learned a thousand years in his eyes as a watch. What a watch is in the Jewish culture is starting at nine o'clock at night, um, from actually from six o'clock at night, sorry, when their day starts, six to nine o'clock, a three hour period is the first watch. 9 p.m. to midnight, second watch. Midnight to 3 a.m., third watch. 3 a.m. to 6 a.m., fourth watch. That's um, notoriously the darkest time of the night, right before the dawn. Jesus came to them in that fourth watch period. But what God showed me in that moment was Jesus came in the fourth watch. Now we know if you believe the Bible is true from start to finish and you follow the timelines that are there pretty easy, that the earth, when Jesus came, was about 4,000 years old. So what he quickened in my heart was he came in the fourth watch in more ways than one. Okay. So I'm reading this and I'm like, wow, that's awesome, Lord. And he'd just been showing me um, pictures and numbers to what the 2020 was going to be all about. That's for another time. But we're in there and I'm reading Psalm 91 because he's unpacking it to me like he was to the rest of the world in many ways. And I get to Psalm 91 verse six and it says, um, nor the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor the destruction that lays waste at noon. That jumped out to me and I was like, huh, I wonder where we are on the prophetic time clock. So if Jesus came at just the fourth watch, right? And that ends at 6 a.m., where are we? So we're about 2,000 years from when Jesus walked on the earth. Um, so that would be one more watch, two more, another watch. They don't do that. They don't say fifth watch, sixth watch, but go with me. I did. And I calculated on the clock that would take us from 6 a.m., which is the end of the fourth watch, to 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. We're at noon. And when he jumped off the page in that moment was, he goes, that's what this time is for. What you guys are going through. He said, surely he will deliver you from it. And what? The destruction that lays waste at noon. So I was, that was awesome enough for me. I was like telling everybody about that. <laughs> it was epic, right? So 2021 comes and um, I'm 
kind of on this mantra. I go to bed one night, wake up the next morning. I have this vivid dream. There's only been a handful of vivid dreams that I know the Lord gave me specifically to show me something. This was one of them. I wake up, I come downstairs and I'm like, man, I just had a crazy, awesome dream about a wedding. And my then 15, 14 year old said, oh my gosh, so did I. And we looked at each other and I said, are you kidding me? What was your dream? So I tell her mine, she tells me hers. Here's the long and short of this dream. My dream was in the dream, I was the bride. In the dream, I was on the way. Somebody was taking me. I don't remember who it was in my dream, taking me to the um, where the wedding feast would be, you know, the table. The table was all set up, but no one was there. None of the people, none of my attendants that were supposed to be there with me were there. And I was panicking and I realized, oh my gosh, I didn't tell them where it was or what time it was. That's when I woke up. My daughter's dream was she was watching the wedding. She was one of the guests and she was sitting and it was an outdoor wedding and she was sitting there and they were all ready, just about to start the wedding. And all of a sudden it started raining and she woke up. And so what I took in that moment was the Lord was reminding me like, oh my gosh, the wedding represents the wedding feast of the bride. Like this marriage is about to happen between Jesus and his bride, which is the church, right? This is, this is what we're all waiting for, this epic event. He showed me, you have to tell your people. You haven't told your people what time was to tell your people. So I just like lit a fire inside of me of talking about this and telling everybody what was coming. And I just looked at it like the rain kind of was, um, it was a rain delay. Like it was the rain's fault. It, anyway, it was crazy. I was experiencing a firsthand, my, my daughter was experiencing it as an outsider. So time passes by and uh, we get to January of 2022 and I'm talking to him about the year. What does this year hold? And just like in 2020, he gave me a math equation. <laughs> this math equation I saw in my head for the numbers 22 was 11 plus 11 equals 22. And as soon as I saw that on my page written down, I saw it as a date, 11, 11, 22. Now, mind you, I just have to tell you that same week we were on our way to church and it was one of those South Carolina rains where you cannot see. It's like the entire sky opens up. And I felt him, I just felt him rest on me as we were, we were talking about rains in Israel as a family on the way to church <laughs> and um, how things on the earth can often reflect what's going on in the spiritual realm. And it, we're, it's this rain. And all of a sudden I was like, oh my gosh, this is the year the heavens open up and we have rain on earth that we've never understood. Like the enormity of what God's doing. It's like the heavens are going to open up over us. And all of a sudden we cross a vulture, a dead vulture in the middle of the road, which I've never yet seen and never seen again. And my, my youngest yells out, there's a dead vulture. And I felt the Lord say, and the children are the ones that will declare it. Well, now, mind you, I'm sitting there realizing 11, 11, 22 is a date, right? Looking at this and I Google it. What's 11, 11, 22 on the Hebrew calendar? And what jumps up in front of me is the Bible chapter that I was reading with my kids, of course, about in Genesis, about when God told Noah to make an ark and staring at me on that page on my, my computer or my phone is the 17th of Chesphon, which I just read literally is here's. Here's the thing you have to know before we go any farther. What's so profound about this is the Jewish calendar and the calendar we use, I don't know if they call it Gregorian, whatever, doesn't line up. It's, they don't have the same number of days in the months. So ours, where ours will go 365 days and then 364 every four, they, it's routine. Like you will know back through all history, um, it's what it is and you can follow it, but it's not the same as ours. So the fact that 11, 11, 22 exactly lines up with 17th of Chesphon, <laughs> Of this, year, of this year way back in the old testament and i'm staring at it on the page it's the day that noah went into the ark and god closed the door and there was rains on the earth the heavens opened are the words it says and there was rains on the earth for the very first time in all of history like we could sit here on that and just like chew on that but my mind was melting out of awe like how on earth do you do it it correlates to the exact day 1656 days after creation, we can follow that because, or not, I'm sorry, 1,656 years after creation. We know that because the genealogy says exactly how long everybody lived when the, when Noah was 600 years and the ark, the rains were on the earth, right? So that is uh, January of last year and my mind is melting, right? So we're going forward, we're going forward and I'm realizing it's getting closer to that. And God starts reminding me about my dream. And remember how I said my age corresponds to the Psalms for that um, particular time. Like, so 44 would be Psalm 44, all that, right? So we're a couple days before 11, 11, 22, where it would 
mark the exact date that Coral spawns, right? And um, he brings me to Psalm 44, which was where we were about to go to. And I realized, he just showed me, that every time I get revelation about what's going to be in this next year, it's always about a month or two before the year starts. For My birthday's in January, so like around November, I start getting it, and it hit me. None of this stuff comes except for the Spirit. I was born again, for lack of a better word, because I have known Jesus my whole life and I have loved him for as long as I can remember. But on November 3rd, 20, 2009 is when he met me on the floor of my daughter's room and he, he took my whole life. He took it. I've never known love like that and I will never look back and never stop talking about him. Praise God, right? And he showed me that's the day. That's the age that we're going by. And I was like, oh, that's awesome. So we went from Psalm 43 to Psalm 44 about two months early, right? So I'm looking at there. In the very short amount of time after he did that, he then flipped us to 45, which is a whole nother story. But literally, I heard him say in my heart, 44 is a hard psalm if you read it. And we were experiencing a lot of hard things as a family. A lot of friends were experiencing a lot of hard things, a lot of physical things. And I was just crying out to the Lord one morning and I heard the Lord say, end it, end it. And he had already showed me ah, the shift that he'd put in me in these timelines that I looked at it and I was like, it is the end of, it is the end of the 44th year. It is the end. We're going into Psalm 45. And on December 26, 2022, I believe the Lord pushed us into Psalm 45 and what we're experiencing there. This is where it all starts to go crazy. Awesome. Not bad. As a top of, top of Psalm 45, my version, it says the wedding song and he brings it all back. And I remember the dream I had with my daughter in the different angles. And I remember the timeline of Noah's Ark and the rains coming on the earth. And I remember what came right after the rains was the wedding. And now he just showed me what comes right after 11, 11, 22. We flip into the next and then we flip into the next. And here we are in Psalm 45. So I'm, I'm just kind of sitting there going, I don't know how to process all of this. Like people won't believe me, Lord. How do I tell them about this, right? So we get a little bit closer into spring of Psalm of 2023. Uh, I hadn't realized it until this moment, but I tried to figure it out before and uh, it jumped off the page when it was supposed to. And I'm back again reading the story of Noah and the ark. And it says that um, we know the date that this all happened, the very first date. But it also says 150, day, five, 150 days from there, something significant happened. Well, I had looked for that date on the calendar, physical calendar, but suddenly that morning I woke up and it was like, look up 150 days from that. Um, so 11, 11, 22 plus another 149 days. What day is it? April 9th, 2023. What is April 9th, 2023? What do we have? Easter, the day that the Christian, Christian religion celebrates the day their savior, our savior, Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Want to know something crazy? April 9th, 3,970 after creation is what the Jewish calendar says. It was absolutely April 9th, Jesus actually rose from the dead. So here I am within 150 days experiencing two dates that match up on our calendar with exactly what happened in history. And my mind is like, okay, so how much more can there be, Lord? Like, how much more can there be? Uh, so I decided to sit down and calculate it. So if, if Jesus rose from the grave in 3,007 or 3,790, we're currently, according to the Jewish calendar, in 5783. And I subtracted them to see how far we were, right? 1,993. Remember when I said at the beginning when this all started, a thousand years is as a watch to the Lord, right? What was... What did I calculate? If you remember, the fourth watch is when Jesus came. And I was thinking we're 2,000 years after that, which would be noon. Well, I just realized we are legitimately 1,993 days, not years, excuse me, from when Jesus rose from the ground. We are seven years from noon. Seven years from noon. Now hear me on this. Like, step back and think of the depths of how many different correlations God can do. Jesus was in the grave two days, the Bible says, and he rose early on the third day. Peter, so Old Testament says a thousand years is as a watch. New Testament, Peter says a day is as a thousand 
in the Lord's eyes, right? So a day can also be used simultaneously. Jesus was in there for two days and he came back early on the third. In seven years, we will officially have finished the second day without him physically walking this earth. And it says he came back early. If their day starts, like just, can we even wrap our head around this? Can we even wrap our head around this, right? Okay, I'm gonna throw this out here, one more thing. What God was starting to stir in me was Daniel. If you read the book of Daniel, Daniel read the book of Jeremiah, which I love this. Can we just stop for a second and like give God glory for how his people use his words to watch him bring everything to pass. Like Jesus fulfilled scripture, his life fulfilled scripture. And we say, yeah, yeah, of course he was Jesus. But like, think about this. When Jesus died on the cross, he did not give up his spirit until every single thing was finished. He said when he knew it was all fulfilled, then he said, I thirst. He took the sour wine and then he gave up his spirit. Why? Because that was the last thing he needed to do. He knew the word. Daniel knows the word. He knows Jeremiah was divinely inspired with the Lord and he released a lot of words and Daniel used them when he was in Babylon and he let the Lord release through him when he understood the times. A prophecy saying there was 70 weeks of years until all of this would be finished. All of this meaning all the things that God had told him. 70 weeks of years. What that means is every week is like seven years. So there's seven groupings of seven year periods. Did you know that Jesus literally came at the end of 69 weeks of years. He died on the cross and rose again with 69. We have what's called a missing seven week period. Scholars have lots of different ideas on that. I'm not here to present an idea, I'm not going to school or know any of this. Anything the Lord has given me has been from him for what I have learned from people on how to read the Bible and then he opens it up to me. So I'm not here to argue that in any way. I'm just here to tell you there is a missing seven years. And here we are seven years from what he showed me would be noon, right? Okay, so I wake up yesterday with this and this is, this is just what the Lord does with me. I wake up with bring Benjamin. Oh, sorry, hold on. bring Benjamin. So he and I flipped to Psalm 42 because I know exactly what he's talking about because we've been talking about this whole thing for so long. <sighs> Psalm 42 tells is part of the story with Joseph. Um, we all know him because Joseph and the Technicolor dream codes, right? Joseph is the uh, son of Jacob from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Don't know how familiar you are. It's so important to know your, your history and genealogy, so please read it. Um, but Psalm 40 or Genesis 42 is where at this point in history, Joseph had already, he had a dream when he was younger. I don't know, multiple dreams, but he saw the Lord show him that his brothers and his family were going to bow down to him. And of course he told them because that's just what you do when you hear from the Lord. You tell people, even though you don't think, oh my gosh, they might reject you for that. You just tell them. I, I've learned that. So he told them, they rejected him. They sold him to slave traders. His dad thought he was dead. Here he is in prison in Egypt and ends up because he interpreted dreams for Pharaoh, ends up being promoted in the kingdom to just under Pharaoh. The whole kingdom is his. And he learned because of the dream Pharaoh had, which is oh, so cool because God doesn't just speak to those people who are following him through their own dreams. He speaks to them through others. He can put pieces together, which is what I'm learning. Oh my gosh, so awesome. So at this point in history, there's a famine on the land. And he, through the wisdom that he got through interpreting these dreams for Pharaoh, understood what God wanted him to do at this time, right? He understood the times and here he is in power. And here comes Jacob's 10 sons to go and buy grain from him because they're starving. We come to Psalm 42. Now, Joseph recognizes his brothers, but his brothers think he is dead. They have no idea. And when they see him in the Egyptian garb, they don't for a second think he is a Hebrew brother, right? So Joseph is before them and uh, he tells them, you shall not leave this place until your youngest brother comes. Now here's the story on that. Jacob had 12 sons. He wanted to marry Leah, but ended up, no, he wanted to marry Rachel, I'm sorry. But when he went to get her for a wife, her father tricked him for, because he also had lied before. And he ended up getting his, her sister Leah first and had to work another seven years oh, for Rachel. Well, when he had babies, 
Leah was the one who was fertile and had all these babies. Rachel, who he loved, only had two. The first one was Joseph. The second one was Benjamin. Jacob was distraught when Joseph was murdered, so he thought, because that was the love of his life's child. So he wouldn't let Benjamin go for grain. So here's Joseph recognizing his brothers, but realizing there's one missing. And he says, you shall not leave this place until your youngest brother comes. Now the Lord woke me up with that and I knew what he meant, but I'm re reading this story just crying. Like I can't believe my head is experiencing this. And I realized, if we flip, and we're in 42 verse 24, it says, he turned away from them and wept. This is Joseph. And he returned to them again and talked with them. He wept because they didn't recognize him. They didn't know who he was. And he took Simeon from them, that's one of the brothers, and he kept, kept him and bound him before their eyes, and he sent them back to go and get their brother. Now, Simeon, it's an interesting thing. The words, the name Simeon means hearing. So here Joseph, who is the most prophetic picture of Jesus that we have in the Bible, was rejected by his own brothers, right? The Israelites, sold into slavery. And his being sold into slavery actually allowed him to be in a position to deliver all of mankind, in including his house, right? So now he wants to see his brother, his blood brother, mind you. And he sends his brothers who don't recognize him back to go get him but he holds on to Simeon, their hearing. And I heard the Lord say this so clearly. Those 10 represent us, meaning us that don't have the family bloodline of the Israelite nation that are the Gentile nation that Jesus came so that we would all be grafted in, right? We were sent back to get our younger brother, the blood brother, the one <laughs> that the father is holding on to because he doesn't know the other but their hearing is lost. They aren't able to hear clearly because they need to bring back this brother in order for their hearing to be fully restored so they can see who's in front of him. Now hear this, who is the blood brother? The Israelites, the actual Israelites, not just the ones that we're going to tell the whole world. Yes, tell the whole world, bring Benjamin. The Lord is saying, my blood. Bring back my blood. Because you know what happens? We'll go forward to this. Psalm 40, or Genesis 43, verse 16. When Jesus saw Benjamin with them, he said to the steward, take these men to my home, make ready, for I dine with them at noon. He was coming back for this epic meal, this feast with his family, only when this brother was brought bring Benjamin. And I feel the Lord saying so strongly, like, this has been the call in our generation. No, on every generation since Jesus first went back to heaven. It has been prolonged and prolonged and prolonged. And we have many different reasons why, but just living at this time in history and seeing some revivals break out and the words that are be spo being spoken over the next generation, I have felt this growing inside of me of like the Lord wanting to release something over his people. And it wasn't until this week when he said, bring Benjamin and it all lined up that it made sense. Did you know that when, G when Joseph sent his brothers back to Jacob to tell him to get their brother and bring him back, they didn't go right back. They ate up all the food that he had sent them home with. They did not go right back. They didn't know really who he was. They didn't understand all of this. And it took them to the point where they had nothing left to finally convince Jacob to let Benjamin go, to come back. And that's when he woke me up with this. I heard in my spirit so clearly, I would have walked by them. Now, because we're building this history and all of these timelines fitting together, I knew exactly what he meant. When he showed me about how Jesus came in the fourth watch, when he was walking on the water, I knew that the, the Gospels tell different angles of the story, right? Matthew 14 was where that particular day in 2020, he had took me. But it was Mark 6, the story of Jesus walking out to them in the fourth watch, where it records Jesus would have walked by. And I heard it so clearly. We are seven years from noon. Joseph 
had the table ready at noon. At noon was when he was going to come back, but he wouldn't come back until his youngest brother, his blood brother was there until his other brothers would go back and do what they were called to do and bring this younger brother back and they would dine at noon. And what he said so clearly was, I would have walked by. And I feel him saying, don't let me walk by. Don't let me walk by. And I wrote this, tell them, Lisa. I would have walked by in the fourth watch, but if you read it, they cried out to me. You have to cry out to me. When I delivered my people from Egypt, after all the bondage they were under for 400 years, it took till the moment that they cried out that I could release Moses to do what he was always born to do. I came to him when they cried to me. There are appointed times for what is to come. If you recognize the call before the time has fully come, you run the risk of running into a desert season when I've already positioned you in the palace. But there are puzzle pieces falling into a place that you may not even realize must come first. Wrestle with me for this to come. I am on your side. The Israelites were imprisoned in captivity in Egypt for 400 years because of something I declared hundreds of years before to their father Abraham. The Amorites were a piece of the puzzle they didn't even know about. And until their puzzle piece was done, the Israelites couldn't be released. Your puzzle piece is complete. You have seven years until noon. What will you do with them? Do not acquiesce your opportunity to be one of those on the front lines by prophesying it to the next generation. Now hear me on this, this is super important. We can prophesy over the next generation and see what God can do through them and speak that into them. It is so vitally important. But what we cannot do, what we cannot do is give to the next generation the ability to walk in something that God ordained us to be able to step into. As for me and my house, we are walking into that land. The Lord told us that we could. When he delivered the Israelites, all of them were welcome into the land. They were going straight there. But there was 10. Interesting, right? He sent the spies in. But 10 of them, 10 of the 12 said, not a chance. They're too big. We're too little. And the people listened. And as a result of them listening to the 10, they could not go into a land that they were destined to go into. Their children would. I declare over us that we have been living that generation until now. And the Lord is saying, step out of it. You are the generation that is meant to go in. Just going to give you a little sideline. Go read Judges 6 and 7. It's the story of Gideon. It is the story when he um, was called by the Lord. So many are familiar with it. They know he put the fleece down and make it wet, Lord, and the ground dry, or make it dry, Lord, and the ground wet, right? To confirm that he knew what the Lord was telling him. Well, when he finally owned it, like so many of us have to grow and own, yes, the Lord is talking to me. He got about 32,000 people to come and fight this battle that the Lord was calling him to. And the Lord like said, yeah, not a chance because there's too many with you. If you do it with that many men, they're going to take the credit. And this is all me. And so tell those that are afraid, go back. And about 10,000 left. Then he said, nah. Oh no, I'm sorry. About 20,000 left because he had about 10,000 left. And he said, nope, too many, too many. Now, whatever I tell you, these are the ones you choose. And he took them to the water and he said, tell them to drink. And whoever drinks it with their tongue, those are the ones you choose. There was 300 warriors chose to walk forward. And let's do this, not even fight a battle. They wouldn't even have to fight. 300 chosen because of what they did with their tongue. 300. Now the awesome thing is, the spoils that they were about to get would impact generations. All of the Israelites would benefit from it. But those 300 would get to see it firsthand. They would get to see the enemy fall at their feet in an epic battle that would be recorded in history and that we would all talk about. We are at a point in history that will be retold for generations. And the Lord is saying, do not let me walk by. You are seven years from noon. Bring Benjamin. 
I would walk by. Don't let me.